We are back with another episode of the Grunge Bible Podcast. My name is Ethan Shalway. I'm joined as usual by my good friend, my good looking friend, the mustache man, oh, Chris yeah. Salona. Uh, Chris, I did just shave down to my mustache yesterday. Um, I'm only a week because I, I panic shaved last week. I needed a change of pace. So um, we were going to talk about that because we owed everybody a good mustache episode. So you're holding up your end of the bargain this week. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sure. I think next week I'll be right there. If any of you guys are watching on YouTube, because um, you, you can't really see us anywhere else. So uh, anyway, we got a great episode, another anniversary episode. But first, let's see how we're doing. Let's check out. Let's check in. We'll do the it's a, the daily check in. We'll, we'll call this the uh the weekly check-in, I guess it is. But Chris, how are you? I'm good. And and Ethan, I'll tell you what, um, it makes my day uh, exponentially better to know that, uh, you know, I have you back on the mustache team now. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we had an open roster spot for a little bit since you unexpectedly left the team. But like most things, it was temporary and uh, glad to have you back. Um, it was other- like Dennis Rodman when he, when he disappeared Yeah, he just Vegas. went away. Yeah, exactly. That was me. I, I was like, I, I need to go away. I'll be back and then yeah. I'll be ready to play. But you know, right focus now, on I need some to other things. And- like I'll, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, the mustache and, and Dennis Rodman Rodman when you're playing on the Bulls teams of the 90s like you know everything is just a formality until you get to the playoffs and uh you know right when the time comes you know there's there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to be ready and and here right. you are so what more yeah. could you ask for otherwise uh I'm doing all right uh I'm not not great but not bad I mean there's like there's nothing going wrong or anything I'm just you know one of those days where I don't know you know, it's just, it's very average. Um, it's kind of rainy out. I'm really tired. Um, mm-hmm. Got like a got like a low back thing going on right now from lifting. So hoping that doesn't linger very long. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the show goes on. So how, how are you today? I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. I'm on the up. Uh, last week was tough. I feel like I've had 10 days where I've been, uh, I've been, been pile, been, been piling on. So um, I had some had some eye issues, some conjunctivitis in my eyes. Oh been, man! I, I was I was the man in the box, as they say. Um, <laughs> Your eyes were searching, sewn shut. <laughs> my eyes were sewn shut, and I was uh, searching with my good eye closed. So, yeah, it was it was kind of difficult uh, for a while because it was misdiagnosed, and then and then you know I had some other other payments come up with my car. You know how it goes. Oh yeah, things seem to be going well, and then all of a sudden your car decides to. Uh, provide some damage so yeah mine was just nope. in the shop yesterday too actually <laughs> i dodged a bullet yeah. though uh my mechanic real good guy he had said that there was something wrong with the engine so i assumed it was going to be at least a thousand dollars and he was like oh yeah. <laughs> yeah he's like that's actually not the engine like there's just a clamp on your radiator that's loose it's like a, it's like a ten dollar fix so um wow. that made my day yesterday so you know yeah. we're feeling pretty you, good you need it you need a mechanic that you, you can do trust yeah because if there's anybody that can blow smoke, it's those crooked <laughs> mechanics. Because I don't know anything about cars. No, no, I, you, I mean, I can act like it all day, but yeah, and and we do. Like, like I always pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Like, oh yeah, that's well, you have the, to, uh, you have to walk, you have oh, to have yeah. some sort of confidence, or they're gonna, mm-hmm. they're gonna change all they're your filters for two thousand dollars. The <laughs> exactly, they're gonna, yeah, you they're need gonna, to change your, do everything. They you know need to all change the your blinker fluids and. Yeah. That's like uh, it's like when you go to a bar, like a busy bar, and they want you to keep the tab open, like a like a club type bar, like because they know you're not paying attention. They're just gonna run up a bunch of drinks on your tab, so you tip more, and so you know they get more money. Um, so yeah. you never never I do always, that, you know. I was closed always down. Trying. Yeah, closed yeah. down shop, <laughs> shut it down. As yeah, they say. <laughs> yeah, we want nothing to do with that. But nevertheless, um, as you said, uh, this is another album review slash anniversary birthday extravaganza uh this week we're going to be taking a look at the core album which was the stone temple pilots debut album which came out on september the 29th 1992 so it is turning 29 years old this year um you know and as we spoke about last week uh there's a hell of a lot of albums that are celebrating their birthdays in the month of september uh you know we're kind of planning to take one at a time we did never mind last week obviously we did 10 and facelift in august you know we're gonna we're gonna get to them as we can you know maybe we get to all of them maybe we don't uh but you know yeah. we're having we're having some fun with it and uh we we'll hope you guys are too but uh before we get into that uh some important 
uh, notifications, I guess, um, in the world of Grunge Bible and Grunge Bible sponsorship. And that is that this episode, as always, is brought to you by the top level patrons, which we have um, who are sustaining this podcast and have been for over half a year now, which is pretty wild. Uh, we've had some people hop onto the train. We've had some people hop off of the train. But um, uh, at the time of this recording, the list is uh, the following individuals who are helping us out here, and that is Laura Nyrene, Kayla Jean, Sue Jade Mercado, Release, Alexis Shannon, Sonny Mashburn, Shannon Gorgon, Victor Schaefer, and Marianne. So to all of you, we thank you dearly as we typically do, and we are very grateful that you're sticking with us, and uh, it's, it's great, to, uh, great to have some company on this strange trip. It is. <clears throat> it does it does feel like we're driving a bus and and they're they're all they're all in the, the passengers. They're sitting behind us and they're they're trusting us. I love that. Yeah. We need them. We need the people. So we're very very thankful. But all right, you want to get into core? What about what about Scott? What about core? What about the Stone about Temple Scott? Pilots? Yeah, you know? we 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 get that a lot. There's definitely a very big uh, Stone Temple Pilots uh, following on the obviously. But like we, I remember when we first started, and we were posting the, uh, we were posting primarily the big four, and um, people would bring up Stone Temple Pilots. I mean, very often they were. It was always like, I mean, they're kind of the fifth band that people think of when you think of um, grunge, and uh, you know, rightfully so. I mean, Scott, Scott definitely has the, uh, you know, the front man status, the kind of the way about him that makes him just fit into the, I don't know the grunge front man and the, in the grunge oh, yeah. lore for, for why we love it, you know, 100%. And I think, um, if memory serves me correctly, unless I dreamt this up, we did do an episode on the stone temple pilots, maybe a couple of months ago. And we, you did. Know, we, we had spoken about that and, you know, people always, always wonder, you know, what our thoughts are about the stone temple pilots or, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I feel like they're not, they're not as polarizing as they were, you know, because obviously we weren't alive, but looking back, I mean, they got slammed, you know, in the world of critical acclaim, you know, around yeah. the time of core and, you know, even just throughout as being like grunge ripoffs or whatever, or hanging on the coattails of Eddie Vedder or what, whatever, you know, low down cliche you wanted to use. But I, I don't really feel like, I mean, obviously there's always going to be people that come through the woodwork and they're like, I never liked these guys anyway. And they suck. It's like, okay, well mm -hmm. that's, that's fine. You, you don't have to listen to them. Um, but I, I don't really, I don't really get a whole lot of that anymore and i don't know if it's because you know because scott isn't with us anymore and people you know tend to you know look back uh they don't look back in anger uh to quote uh oasis i guess uh they don't you know they don't look back with uh so much negativity you know after you know someone has you know passed away i think a lot of that elevates the status of bands which we've spoken about before but i mean I, i've always liked the stone temple pilots um you know, I think everybody learns learns the Stone Temple Pilots from Plush, but I mean, I, th <laughs> I think I think it gets better. You know, the more the more you get into their their record, and, and certainly on this one, like I would not say that Plush is my favorite song, but uh, what are, what are your right. thoughts about STP these days here in two thousand twenty one? Overall, like how my my yeah, just, right now? just in I mean, general, yeah. I, I they're definitely for whatever reason they're kind of a sleeper band that I. I forget about when I when I go to listen to uh, the genre and whatnot, or if I'm trying to like, it's like you listen to the. I usually listen to like the big four, or I do like a. I try and be really diverse, so I, I move to more obscure bands. But um, but they are so consistent, and every time I look back and I listen to them, and I, as I was listening back through this album, there is a real. There's just a really talented um, group of musicians that play together, and I really I love the. I love all the compositions. I feel like, I mean, the DeLeo brothers, like there's some really great guitar parts and, and it's oh, really yeah. rock and roll. Like mm -hmm. they're probably the most rock. Well, let's see. Yeah. They're probably the most like rock and roll. Like they have like a, they definitely have a more kind of a classic rock vibe for me. Yeah. Like, I think they're, you're right. And they're, rock, and they're rock, on the rock side of songs. Like they're obviously their, their softer songs have a whole different feel to them, but yeah. they have like a rock and roll to them that is just classic and i think that's why they get a lot of radio play in or in my head at least it seems like i know a lot of their songs from the traditional radio and like 100 they're great they i mean they have great parts and scott has like a very 
obviously a very strong voice that's just yeah super talented. And, and you make, yeah, and you make a really good point. Like I think out of all of the bands, like the Stone Temple Pilots would have been most at home in the musical landscape of like the seventies, for example, when Zeppelin ruled yeah. the world and all of that stuff was they going made on. It. They, yeah. they like for because for me like the only reason why I would ever consider them in the conversation of grunge is just because where they are on the chronology of music. I think, you know, um, musically they, they probably fit in a little better in the seventies and, you know, the early seventies when like the concept of the rock band was the biggest thing in the world and, you know, grunge didn't exist. And because I don't really think they have, you know, any, uh, influence of punk or anything like that. Um, but, um, there is a, there is a fantastic, origin story to stone temple pilots now i believe they were born out of uh the california music scene but um yeah. back in the 80s in 1985 there is a there is a uh, an origin legend regarding this band as to how uh the individuals that contrived the band got together and just I love like, these origin stories we're, yeah we're, just, just like we're sean like kenny drumming with right a broken now. hand on facelift and uh yeah. whatever the other one was that we talked about this one this Pearl one's jam yeah. yeah this one's pretty great um so allegedly in 1985, Scott Weiland and Robert DeLeo were at a Black Flag concert, and they met one another, and evidently they were at the show, and they were just making small talk, and they were telling each other about their girlfriends, only to find out that they were both referring to the same girl. Mm-hmm. So apparently this this girl was playing both sides <laughs> wow. against the middle, and um, rather rather than you know beat one another up over it, they both you know, acknowledged the situation and decided to uh, both break up with their respective girlfriend who was the same individual. And then I guess throughout, <laughs> out of that, the band or the musical connection was born and they started. I mean, that's an incredible connection and commitment to. I don't think right it's true. Like <laughs> there's no way that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, 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 that like, there's does no not fucking sound way like that that's what any, happened. There's, there just, that doesn't sound like it would live in the world it is today. Like there's no, I don't know if two people that would, I don't think people, I don't think they would have reacted. Yeah. They wouldn't have reacted like that. You know, there, there would have been, there would have been pejorative terms, uh, you know, directed as much as the world has, as much as the world has changed over the, the 25 years, I think that the man back then would do this or the, like men would oh, still yeah. act the same like, way. Yeah, so that, that no instinct, way that, that yeah. I mean, it, like, if that's the case and they actually were like, you know what, they were very diplomatic about it. Um, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. pretty great. And, uh, you know, they were able to move forward. So they started, um, uh, you know, Scott and Robert, I think they were playing, you know, together in the mid eighties, late eighties, just kind of doing whatever. And then eventually they recruited, um, you know, Robert's brother Dean to play guitar um, and then I believe they, the three of them saw Eric Kretz playing drums at some show with a band, um, and, uh, you know, began to recruit him and eventually he rounded out the, the four, four person lineup that we know today, but they were recording in the nine, in the, in the eighties, well, not recording, they were playing in the late eighties and, and, you know, around the turn of the turn of the decade in 1990 as uh, mighty Joe young. That's what they were originally known as. But I believe when they went in to record their first record, um, they, uh, you know, they were informed that there was a blues musician, I think, by the name of Mighty Joe Young. So they had to change it, much like Pearl Jam had to change from Mookie Blaylock. And um, once again, I, there's a few stories that I've heard as to why they settled on the Stone Temple Pilots. I think, like the STP racing thing, like they knew that. And mm. I think they just created an acronym. I had heard a rumor that one of the acronyms that they decided or had wanted to use. Uh, was uh, it's it's so incredibly vile. Uh, I am not going to share it. Oh yes, um, yes, yeah. We can we we can talk about that uh, in another at another time or on a post or something. But yeah, obviously they were not going to be able to <laughs> release a record on Atlantic Records as as that. Uh, and then they settled on the Stone Temple Pilots, and um, nevertheless they went into the studio in December of 1991 and came out in January '92 with. Uh, the finished product and they released it later that year in 1992 so it's it's so strange like i don't know obviously it's never as straightforward as it seems but it seems like the stone temple pilots had one of the least serpentine roots to becoming a band you know during this era it's like it's like 
you know, with all of the other mythic origin stories of like a Pearl Jam or like Nirvana or something, and Dave Grohl just like driving from Virginia to Seattle and yeah. Eddie Vedder surfing, you know, and like happening to get this tape from Jack Irons from Stone Gossard. Like this is this is pretty straightforward. It's like, hey, like we're playing music. They were opening. I think they opened for the Rollins Band in like the late '80s, and you know they just were able to, I guess, have some demos and Atlantic wanted them at the time. So it seems like just kind of happened, you know, it's transactional almost. Yeah. And then, yeah. And it, and it worked well. I mean, yeah, it is, it is kind of cut and dry, straightforward, you know, I guess good for them. I mean, and then, they, you know, this is their first album, their debut album was core, which I mean, where does that rank for you as far as albums for them? I mean, it's not it my number one. It's, or it no, it's two? it's not my favorite. So for me, um, the Purple album is always my favorite. And then in recent, oh, if you were to ask right. me a few years ago, I would say Purple, then Core, then Tiny Music, and then number four. But Tiny Music and number four have been making some strides just based off of what I've found appealing to listen to. But I, I do enjoy Core. It's for me, it's great lifting music. You know, with the exception of Creep, it is, it's yeah. fantastic lifting music. Um, I mean, and plush. Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> do, you, do you listen? Yeah, plush as well. I mean, I've talked about it a few times, and you yeah. guys probably know. Like, we used to play it, but every it's, every it's everybody probably, played plush, yeah. you know. Yeah, it, it's it's probably not my you know my honest favorite to listen to. But not there's anymore. a reason it was so like, popular, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just like it was overplayed on the radio, it's been overplayed in in my yeah. presence. And well, it's the all same that. thing like <laughs> the Teen Spirit thing we were talking about last week. Like, right. it is it is impossible for me to relate my brain my you know, 24 year old brain to a time where plush was a new song or teen spirit wasn't overplayed, you know? It's like we were talking about earlier. If you teach someone else's kids to ride a bike, that moment is now gone. You can't, you (laughs) can't get it back. It's like, it's just like the first time you hear a song like smells like teen spirit or when it broke like that excitement of that first like few months of when when a song breaks or a band breaks you don't get that again, and that's why these that debut band. albums find, are so that's important. Why we, that's why we look for other, and that, that yeah, that's why these debut albums are so legendary and big. Is because yeah, it's the time that they break, and you can't get that moment back. You can't learn to ride that a bike twice. Like, you can't learn to ride a bike twice. I mean that that moment that you know Dave Grohl brought the drums in, and the first time they heard it, could you you know the epiphany that they had? I remember, oh my like, god, yeah, like like this is exact. This they knew it was going to take it to the next level. So well, like fuck like being a teenager in 1992 and turning on MTV and seeing Teen Spirit for the first time or something you know yeah. whereas now I mean it's just you know it's old it's news but I mean it, it kind of has you to just be hear that but, song you yeah. know exactly and and, and I, I do want to interject here uh, just regarding Stone Temple Pilots the band uh, because a lot of people seem to be very opinionated about this but uh, Grunge Bible's official stance is that Jeff Goot uh, does a fantastic job with the Stone Temple mm. Pilots now they've released music with him um, you know Dean, Robert yeah, and are Eric are all fans, yeah. you know they're all creating music along with Jeff and they're having a lot of fun doing it and and Jeff does a great job on the old stuff too you know all the old stuff from Scott and um, I love the fact that they're still making music and and I've listened to him sing a lot of these songs on the core record and I think it's great you know I mean Scott's not here to do it anymore and and you know Chester's not here to do it anymore so you know it's just it's anytime you can continue that legacy I think is important but you know kind of talking about that legacy uh, where where would you place the core album in your in your hierarchy of of STP? Is it is it towards the top or is it kind of somewhere near the middle or? Yeah, I, I actually, um, I, I I would say that it it probably is number two. I I think purple album. I'm I just was looking at the set the the rundown of the album. And yeah, yeah, it's a different speed. I think I I do like the I I mean I like the high intensity rock of stone temple pilots, but I do really appreciate their slower stuff. So I think that that probably puts the core album like in the middle two or three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because, yeah. And we talked, we talked about, um, we talked about this on our first pod, which I don't remember what probably is episode like 18 or something. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm, don't quote something me on like that, that, but, but um, we we definitely talked about the diversity of the band, and and that's why I think we like them a lot because they really they really have a good range, and they have so much um, to offer, and and you know the softer stuff and the, the harder stuff, and and they're you know they show they show their you know attitude or however you want to say they, their expressions in both really well, and uh, so yeah I, I think core I mean 
I'd probably put it probably put it in the middle, but maybe maybe towards maybe towards the top, just because like it really does have a lot of notable songs that we'll we'll probably run down it here soon or something. But I mean, it's just it's a well put together album, and I I can really appreciate that. Yeah, and I think for me goes without saying. I think anything that Scott Weiland put out with STP certainly back in the '90s, you know, he's the first thing that you're drawn to, especially if you watch him live. But for me, I think you know if if Scott is you know the undisputed like you know major attraction of 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 listening to the Stone Temple Pilots, which I think he is for me, you know, right up there with him is uh, is Dean's work on on guitar. I I just think you know his ability as a songwriter and just like. You know, a lot of people, I mean, myself included, you know, if you talk about like the riff masters of, of the grunge era, you know, Jerry Cantrell is up there. I think, uh, you know, Kim Thiel from Soundgarden's right up there. But I, I think Dean DeLeo, like he's up there with the best of them, man. I mean, some of the guitar parts that he came up with, uh, you know, just the way that he goes back and forth with his brother, you know, Robert, who's on the bass. Um, you know, I think, I think it's yeah. great. You know, they really... Um, you know, and, and that's going back to what we were talking about with like hearing plush for the first time. Like there was a time where this music didn't exist, like they created it, you know, and, and just the creativity that they had and just the ability to, you know, in a way kind of capture that like classic rock, hard rock sound yeah. from, you know, their childhoods and, and package it and recreate it in, in, a, in a fresh new way for us to hear. Um, you know, I think is really, really cool. And, you know, obviously Scott had a lot of, you know, a whole thing going on with like the, the doors thing, the Jim Morrison thing with being influenced by them and by Jim. And, uh, yeah, I just, I just think, you know, I don't know. I never really got people saying the STP weren't unique. You know, I, I, I do think what they, what they did at the time was unique mate, you know, certainly more so as they got deeper in their career, but even, even on the core album, I think it was, it was really solid, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm absolutely and um i think a little side note the uh the album i think i saw that in rolling stone it, it rated it number 11 out of the top 50 grunge albums now i don't really oh, yeah. know what what all that you know encompasses what bands yeah and stuff, what their but, definition uh, 11 is. out of 11 out of 50 does that sound right to you not um, knowing the bands or the parameters of no, it all, I would, but. <laughs> yeah, not know, not knowing who's in it because obviously with us, you know, we we have a much more uh, pointed Dude description broader. of what grunge is, yeah. you know, with it just being mud honey. Um, but I mean, yeah. I I don't think I would place Core at the eleventh best, you know, because that well, I don't know. I mean, there's so many variables. Like, do they consider the Pumpkins grunge? Do they consider right. you know Son is Sonic? You, I don't know. I I don't Limp think I would biscuit. put this I mean, in so puddle of mud. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, imagine Nickelback dragons. Is, you know, I mean, their their new did record. You read, I posted. Did you read what Pitchfork? I did. Yeah, Pitchfork I was like scrolling crucified through. Crucified so, them. <laughs> yeah. So we follow Pitchfork on on the page, and I was just scrolling through. And I looked, and I was like, I read it, and it was a picture of the Imagine Dragons new album, and they just slaughtered them in like four four sentences. And it was like read more in the bio, read more in the link in the bio. <laughs> There's nothing and more I, to I read like, at that point. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, wow, did they really put a whole piece out on this? I was yeah, like, here I just, just I just I just pulled it yeah, up. This is too up. important. So, um, yeah. this was news to me that the Imagine Dragons released <laughs> yeah, a new album because I don't I don't follow their music. I I would I don't think yeah. I would consider they myself. Fell, they had they fell off the cliff. I I mean their first, yeah, their first album, album was because I was in high school. I liked yeah. it. You know, yeah, it was totally fine. It's time that like everybody was using as like their graduation song. That was my you know, graduation. Yeah, song. I exactly. It. You know, I'm, uh, why don't good. you understand? It, I'm never going to change who I am or whatever. Like that was, it was, it was very easy to digest. Um, it was, and it was good. It was before, it was like before, it was before everybody got really, really corny. Yeah. I think hundred percent. And, and I think like, it was back when Coldplay was good. <laughs> exactly. And I think like, I'll preface reading this with saying that like, it's very easy to pick on the Imagine Dragons, but like we're gonna do it too because I don't really yeah. appreciate them. But they they dismantled this record. They said, I guess it's called Mercury, and they said Mer <laughs> Mercury tries to be all things to all people, but mostly it's a headache, a grim study in just how patronizing popular music can be in 2021. Imagine Dragons do intermittently demonstrate some signs of growth, but these don't count for much. Attempts at maturity really don't go all that far on an album that mostly sounds like a truck full of teens driving by and flashing the shocker at you. Read our full <laughs> review at the link in bio. What else is there to say about that? <laughs> like, that just is slam scathing. the door shut. Like, who was like, they probably woke up and they're like, 
God, I need to just, I need to post this. I can't stand this album. Like, who who decided, like, we need to destroy Imagine Dragons? Like, who's paying for that yeah. post? And they, they gave, gave, they gave like, it a 4.4 like, 4. 4 out of 10. I can't believe it's like, it's not a 2 after after that. <laughs> yeah, it made, me, it made me want to go, maybe that's like reverse propaganda, because it made me want to go listen to Mercury just to see, like, you know. I want to be up to date with what I'm slandering, but yeah. I can't believe it. I, I, I like, I mean, I can believe it. But. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can totally believe it. I mean, they just, they just absolutely demolished them. Like, where? I mean, obviously, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think you know people are, or or bands or musicians are, you know, incredibly in tune with probably what pitch forecasts say about them. But I mean, that's yeah, they got they got them pretty good, man. But uh, yeah. I mean, That's funny. yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, people don't think that about the Stone Temple Pilots or the Grunge Bible podcast. Um, I would, yeah. I would love, I would love a good scathing review of this podcast. Um, that would really, that would really light my fire in the mornings. Yeah, we'll get one. Yeah, hopefully, it's coming. I guess we need hotter takes. Yeah. Okay. Imagine Something dragons like are good. I fucking love Mercury. It's the best record of the of the decade. You won't post about you won't post them later. <laughs> oh, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be I mean Greta Van Fleet gets a lot of slack. Miley I've Cyrus been meaning post to post Greta Van slack. Fleet for the past week, but I haven't gotten around to it. Um so we're gonna pretty soon, one of these days, we're gonna have like a all we're gonna do we're yeah. gonna do we're gonna Miley, do, we're gonna do Greta Van Fleet, we're gonna do Imagine Dragons and Mumford and Sons yeah. and everybody, the Lumineers. What what month is April? Three? Four. Four. Okay, perfect. October first, it'll be half April Fool's Day. There you go. So we're gonna, six months later. Yep. So April uh, or October first, we'll post some. Yep. We'll just we'll so, stir up the shit. So prepare storm. yourselves. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, the core album, yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah, back, <laughs> back to Stone Temple Pilots. So let's let's pick out some let's pick out some of these tracks here and talk about. It. I mean, shit, man. Yeah. Like they they started this album off with Dead and Bloated. You know. Yeah. That is that I remember, you know, I discovered this song when I was, you know, but a lad and it's kind of it's kind of scary. I love the whole megaphone thing, you know, Scott's got going on mm-hmm. in that one and that was a great song to see live. I mean, this whole this whole album, I'm I'm pretty sure like it, it was very intentional on Scott like I think he put out something like he like he, he said humanity is confused and this album is like a lot to do with that and I feel like all of his songs like they're not they're not angry but they're all very like they're very like direct they're and pointed very, like, yeah especially yeah they're very driving yeah and, and it shows in all the music yeah and, and i think in terms of like the intent i don't think it gets much more intentional than the second track sex type thing which was yeah. ended up being the first single in january of 93 and you actually just did a post on this song and, and i think mm-hmm. a lot of people don't i guess realize what the message of it is and, and you know similar to you know similar to rape me by nirvana you know mm-hmm. it's i think it's a very misunderstood song but you know at the time I don't know. I struggle because I wasn't alive. Obviously I struggle to understand, you know, maybe what the climate was back in the early nineties. And, you know, certainly now you could say we have a long way to go in terms of, you know, just, um, you know, being decent human beings to one another and, you know, not, yeah. not hurting people and everything. So I can imagine that back then there was even a longer way to go. And, you know, for a big rock band to put out a song like this, you know, kind of pretty much against sexual assault and calling out, I think as he, as he termed it, you know, all the macho masculine guys who think it's okay, um, you know, to do what they want. And it was after a very specific school, like story, like a high school story. Oh, was it? It was like, yeah, yeah. It was like, there was like a, there was a a couple football players, like, you know, raped a a, a young girl Mm -hmm. after a, Friday night or something. So yeah. it was all about that. And the lyrics, you know, I think the, you know, I think he wrote about it cause I can't believe people are so confused with the lyrics. Right. And, like, and if you read them, you know, and you have no idea, I, I can understand maybe the confusion, but, um, you know, he tried to make it very clear and he was pretty upset when people were misunderstanding like what it was. Yeah, um, certainly. Yeah. But yeah, they, he and I think that that's like a, a theme on a, like that song, and I think Naked Sunday is also has, and that's also on the album, mm-hmm. I believe. Correct. Yes. And um, yeah, there's like there's like some very serious top topical stuff in there that he puts in, and uh, you know, I, it's it's hard because a lot of people listen to music, you know, just to like listen to music and right. stuff, and then that's when you know if you don't 
if you don't take the, like, I know you are very intentional when listening to lyrics and stuff and that gets lost. And it's, it's, it's tough when, uh, you know, people can just, I don't know, kind of miss, misinterpret stuff because they don't necessarily want to go deeper with like, or like see the background on songs. And I don't, I, you know, yeah, it, I guess I under, I understand why they don't, but like, or they don't want to get, they don't, I don't want to put too much time into it, but right. it kind of stinks when you're, when you're talking about a serious subject, like, yeah, rape me or sex type. Thing yeah, exactly. And, and I think a lot of the times, you know, the songwriters don't package it in such a way that it's, you know, like an easily readable billboard, like, Hey, like sexual assault is bad. You know, they have their, their way of, you know, packaging it in such a way that, you know, they get their point across, but, you know, in a unique way or, you know, in a, in a way that might, you know, get you to think about it a little bit longer, but, yeah. you know, um, yeah. And, and I think with Scott, you know, he was such a dynamic front man and he had such a great voice and, you know, he was so fun to watch. I think a lot of times like people focus on that and don't really focus a lot of times on maybe what he was saying or, you know, what his messages might've been or, you know, what his, intentions were or whatever and, and i and i think that's evident you know here a little bit on the record but i mean one thing i think about this record is just you know how many of these songs i have heard on fm radio you know i mean this song was so um i mean this album rather was so accessible and it was so just ready to mm -hmm. blow up i mean even even the third song i mean you so like there's like dead and bloated sex type thing wicked gardens on there creep plush cracker man where the river grows i mean all of these songs you know could have been could have been number one singles you know yeah and uh, yeah like you said i think i heard all of those on the radio um yeah they're all good they're all really good and like you said it's a good weightlifting uh playlist i feel like i mean cracker man is really good yeah i like cracker I, man. I think wicked i think wicked garden might be my favorite um, song off this album. I've always really liked that. Mm -hmm. I love the um, the unplugged version that they do. Oh yeah, that and one's great. Yeah, that one's really good. It, it's one of the songs that just it does super well live and acoustic, mm -hmm. um, which I love. I love when songs transition well from you know the acoustic guitar to the electric and you know back and forth. Um, let's see. Obviously, plush is good, but yeah, I think Wicked Garden might be my number one. Yeah. Um, I think how about you? I think I agree with that. So for the longest time, it was Wicked Garden, um, you know, and, yeah. and and if that's number one, then one A for me is probably Cracker Man, and then then I would say where where the river goes. Um, but I mean, there's really they're all really great. Even even something like Sin or No Memory, you know, I've been able to mm -hmm. been able to get into those a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, just talk about you know this kind of relates in a way to how they're you know, formation and like the production and release of this record was like fairly straightforward. I think the, the music on here, you know, uh, I guess at least, um, to listen to it, maybe not to, you know, maybe not the lyrics or the messages behind it, but just like the way that it sounds, it was just, it was just ready for people to listen to. And, and I think, you know, there's always, I mean, shit, if, if this record was released in September of 1991, you know, or, or September of 1990, I don't think people would have shat on it as much as they did. I think it was just a, a victim of its time. Whereas, you know, by the time 1992 was ending, I think there was a little bit of a revolt at times of people, you know, people felt that there were others trying to capitalize on the grunge scene or whatever. And like, oh, like these guys are just ripoffs. But I mean, you know, if they were recording this in late 1991, I mean, you know, it, grunge hadn't exploded yet. So it's like, I don't know how you could say that they, you know, were rip offs or they went in there trying to rip anything off. And, and I think, I think the stone temple pilots and this album, but especially the band, like they've aged very, very well and their music has held up well. And I think in terms of what the critics think, I think it's probably actually improved. It's pulled, it's pulled like a reverse 1980s hair, hair metal, you know, whereas like that stuff, yeah. in my opinion, at least hasn't aged very well. And, and people are like, you know, guys were talented but like this this music isn't it like i think the stone temple pilots were at first you know people were like oh this is, this is just pandering to grunge posers or whatever um i think now you know people are hopefully recognizing the value in it and and the talent that was there and the you know and in the, in the art that was created yeah <clears throat> um do you think that so I, I have a I have a quote about because I think you know I think it was a very intentional album mm -hmm. and uh, I have a, a lyric well I mean a, a, 
little excerpt from Scott that talks about it. And it's kind of what we said. And, and he puts it pretty directly of what the album is about. And I was wondering, well, I, I can read it first, but think about this. Do you think the title core is like to reflect the us as, us as humans, the core of like, you know, our, our say like, beliefs and like how we view things or do you think it's like you know it could be just related to the band like the first album the core album and it's like very like i guess surface level I would, it probably isn't because so scott wyland um ex- he explains the lyrical style of core is this he says i feel very strongly that all individuals regardless of age race creed or sexual preference should have the freedom to exercise their rights as human beings to enjoy life pursue what they want and feel comfortable about who they are I guess I tend to find the darker sides of life more attractive than the yellow and oranges. I know it's something that I relate to when I listen to music. And so it just goes, I, I like, I was thinking about it cause I was going to ask about like the album artwork and stuff. And cause I always, I always, you know, I, I feel like that's very, it was very intentional back then as it is now. Oh yeah. Um, I think especially and, then. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that, you know, core, I think that it's definitely a, like a look into I don't know, human beings and kind of like the natural drives and stuff and very like, you know, sex type thing, naked Sunday, creep, uh, cracker man. Like the, the, the titles are all very, I don't know. It just seems like it's like it's, where the river goes. Like dark. I want to be as big as a mountain. I want to fly as high as the sun, like that kind of thing going yeah. on. Yeah. I, I think, um, and, and it's been reported that the band chose core, as kind of an allusion to the Adam and Eve story, you know, with the apple and everything. Okay. So, but I think a lot of that, I mean, apple even, core. yeah, okay. even, even, you know, biblically or, or, you know, whether you're religious or whether you treat the Bible as just a historical document or, you know, historical book, whatever, whatever it may be. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in there that I think relate to those things like human nature and, and just kind of a discussion of just the desires that we have as people and maybe, you know, when those desires can impact, you know, other people's rights, you know, like what Scott was saying about like how everybody is kind of, you know, I guess, you know, play on words, I guess for myself, like at the core, you know, all very, you know, very similar. And you know, like we're all trying to go after the right. same things. And yeah, it's interesting. I've never really, I've never really thought about it a whole lot, but I mean, I think, I think yeah. he's totally right. And, and it's always, it's always interesting for me because like statements like that, you know, that he said, you know, regardless of, you know, sexual orientation, race, age, or creed, you know, you want to be able to enjoy your life and exercise, you know, your rights as humans. I like, we hear, we hear those, you know, those things all the time as we should, because they're true. But, you know, I don't know, you know, back in 1992, how many people were saying those things. I mean, for example, like gay marriage yeah. was, was not legal, you know, and, and certainly, you know, I don't know if we'll ever unfortunately solve, you know, the, the racism in, in this country or in the world, but certainly then, you know, they're grappling with that and, you know, just, you know, discrimination and everything. So it's always, it's always interesting for me to look back and just hear people, you know, 30 years ago, you know, say those things, you know, and speaking out. Yeah. yeah but I don't know. What, what do you think? I, I, th- I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot there just kind of about like, you know, the creation story and like the Adam and Eve thing. It's like, you know, um, yeah, the song Sin. Yeah. And it's I mean, like, there's like, it's like looking at the song titles, it's definitely, you know, very wicked garden. I mean, yeah, it's definitely, I, I, I guess I didn't know that bit about the uh, Adam and Eve and like the apple. Yeah. And, like and it's really it, interesting I can, because, I can totally see yeah, it. because even just in this conversation I'm having with you on this podcast, I guess I right should have known that, but yeah, I'm getting like, I'm, 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 my appreciation for this as you know, in it and its intent is growing deeper, you know, because I don't know that I've ever you know thought it about is? it in this light, you know? Yeah. You know what it What's is? That? It's just a good piece of art. Yes. It's a full piece of art. It was, it's thought out from the titles mm-hmm. to the, the intention. Like there, it's a very, it's a very specific thing. And you know, what's amazing about it? It's their debut album. It's yeah. the first thing that they came out with. Like you said, I'm very straightforward. Like maybe that's, maybe that's why it worked out yeah. as well as it did because they were, I mean, I don't know how long, how long were they, did they know each other before they started playing music? Since I guess the mid eighties, you know, so they've been, yeah, they've been together, you know, in some form or another for a few years help, at that, least. Yeah. So it would help a lot, but yeah. you know, it's just, it's just a very complete set of, uh, you know, work and yeah, and it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. It's really, and, it's really good. And honestly, like after this conversation, like, I mean, I would be very happy if that was my day. Oh my God. Like, first, Shit, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? That's, I would be very, <laughs> yeah. Hundred uh, percent excited yeah. about it, and it's interesting too because with this conversation, like I even after having this 
you know, chat with you. Like, I think I have to amend some things that I said earlier, you know, in the sense that it was a very accessible, easy to digest. And, you know, I probably edit that comment I made in the sense that I guess at least yeah, it mu- musically, it wa- I think it was in the sense that you hear right. it and it, it sounds and good and it's, and it just makes sense with the way it sounds and it's catchy and it's, you know, it's good writing, but I think the concepts behind it, I, I certainly, you know, in the last, you know, 15 minutes, I've gotten a deeper appreciation for yeah. it and kind of what their, what their objectives may have been. And it gets at the very, I think the best art and the best music, they're the best because they make you think. And, and this is, yeah. you know, these concepts, whether they mean it or not, they put it out in the world and we ingest it in a way. And it gets us thinking about things, you know, whether they wanted people to be like, I want to release this record so people think about human nature and human desires and human rights and how you know how they all you know are intertwined. Whether or not they thought that, you know, we have the ability to ingest that and and ponder those things because of how the music makes us feel or how the words make us feel, and and that's the best art. You know, it gets you gets you thinking about things, and and that's that's what yeah. the, man, <laughs> that's what this record does. I like this record a lot that's, more than when I started yeah, this. It's this, it's moving up, and it, yeah. you know, it kind of makes me think like so. I mean, we obviously send lyrics to each other a lot, oh, yeah. and this page was built off of posting people's lyrics as like a Bible verse. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like kind of where Crunch Bible. It's all come put a full circle a here. Oh, full circle! This is this is a great episode, guys. I mean, and so I'm I'm thinking about it and like you know this is we have a ton of lyrical geniuses in the genre. Obviously, I mean Eddie and and Chris and you know jerry or they're all very deep but i mean scott as a lyricist and the stuff that he can write and they do um you know it's arguably right oh, up it's there right up like there, yeah could, you know people might appreciate his stuff uh because i mean we there is some really across all of his albums there are great really deep um mm-hmm. like one-liners and and just verses that yeah we've sent to each other and you know, well i think he only gets better after core you know especially i yeah. think with his lyricism and his creativity as a songwriter i think it peaks with you know tiny music um you know and i mean i, I just think he kept getting better and better and better and, and the band you know was able to get better and better but i mean talk about it i mean if this is the starting place i mean come on yeah wow I, That's awesome. I like I like core. This is great. I'm glad uh, I'm glad we chose to do this. And yeah, it's really interesting, you know, to have conversations like this. And you know, whether it be about music or, or anything like that. I mean, people, you know, through conversation and discussion, you have the ability to kind of get new perspectives and maybe learn yeah. some things and think about things it's in a different like, light. You know, you know. Um, a side note, and I think maybe we can wrap it up after this. But yeah. it reminds me of. Uh, <laughs> We had an old coach, me and you together, and he would he would get into an arguments. And I remember one of our teammates, I won't use any names, but <laughs> you probably know we, one of our teammates, and and so he would get into an argument. And the one thing that she hated it was like he gets into arguments and he has no idea. And then halfway through, he finds out what his point is, and then he sticks to mm-hmm. it. So like he kind of stumb- he stumbles into it, like yeah. he he's he yeah, he searches and stumbles into something halfway through the conversation that makes sense, and then all of a sudden, boom, you latch on to yep. it, and. Uh, and I'm not saying that's what we did here, but like, it's so funny when you, when you have a conversation and you like are open to like talking about stuff, that's when you find, that's when you kind of open those doors and you find like new kind of like, Oh wait, you new connections and new things. Yeah. And, and that's why conversation, conversations kill, but conversations <laughs> are so important. <laughs> Absolutely. Because like, it's, it is, it is literally learning. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, teaching in a way, just like talking. So, um, but I always think about that, like things like, yeah, I hate that. Oh, yeah. And, he and, and for the record, I know, I know his... exactly the individuals that you were speaking about. I remember this story and yeah, <laughs> it's not the first um, one, not the but last, but no, but, I, but it is beautiful thing about conversations because yeah, it, sure it, it just takes you to, uh, to learn. And there's some, that's why me, people need to be open to having conversations. I agree. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, every week I get to have one with you about music, sometimes right. not about music, but uh, it's really great. And, and, you know, I think in a way, you know, the people who listen are certainly a part of that conversation too, you know, through, through their listening and, you know, certainly when they reach out to us and uh, you know, if you're enjoying it, certainly send us some messages, tell us what you like and what you don't like. And uh, you know, as, as we've always said, if you're looking to support us in other ways, you can go to grungebible.com for all of those other avenues, um, you know, to show your support, whether it be merch, you know, Patreon, leaving reviews. Um, I'm still, I mean, in a way, it would be supportive of us to go and leave us a Imagine Dragons Pitchfork-esque review, uh, you know, and, and call us pandering or whatever, uh, you know, whatever negative adjectives you would like to use. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, 27 episodes, that's that's a long time running now. Uh, at least it feels like it. And uh, yeah, this, this was probably one of the more fun ones for me, at least, just because I really felt like, you know, my perspective may have changed or I picked up, you know, a different point of view about this record. And um, that's always a lot of fun to be able to do that. Oh, yeah, this was a this was a really good conversation. And that's why I mean, that's why we do it. That's why we like it. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, like Chris said, um, we just are we're just thankful that you guys listen. Um, yeah, what a good one. So um, right on. I guess we got. We got the song of the week coming up. I want to say uh, thank you, Drew, our uh, wonderful producer. Drew McFadden, I'm the man. I'm trying to always remember. Yep, Go Deo Music. Um, that's his tag. If you guys want to, if you guys need Send any him help some with love engineering, on Instagram. He's not, yeah, yeah, he's not bad. Maybe we'll shout him out on the page. Maybe not. But uh, yeah, so why don't we pop over to uh, song of the week? Any or anything else you want to button up with no, Core? I feel really confident that's about with that. it. You know, I'll tell you as soon as as soon as we finish recording this, I'm probably going to throw it on and kind of listen and read along and, and, you know, kind of see what new discoveries I make about, it. I mean, man, this, this thing's going to be 29 in, in, you know, a week or two. And, uh, yeah. you're, I'm still finding different ways to view it. I think that's really great, but yeah, to get to get to song of the week, um, one of those weeks again, I, 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 you know, I wasn't really sure. Um, I had written the notes for this show, uh, probably a week ago, week and a half ago. And, uh, mm-hmm. I had, uh, forecasted a song of the week for myself. That is not the song of the week anymore, but, um, Starting on Sunday, I got up. I, I had to work a little bit this weekend for for my full time job on Sunday morning. Uh, so I got up and you know naturally on Sunday, you know you get the coffee out and you're listening to some Sunday blues. And uh, since then, you know I threw on a nice blues playlist. Since then, I have been listening to a lot of blues, but particularly uh, the artist by the name of Howlin' Wolf. Uh, one of the most prolific blues artists of the 20th century, in my opinion. You know, he recorded probably, I'd say, from the early 50s until the mid-70s when he passed away, I think, in 1976 or 77. But he released an album uh, in 1971, uh, and there's a song on it. Uh, the name of the album is escaping me at this time, but the uh, the name of the song is called 300 Pounds of Joy. Um, and, and the greatest thing about this song, it's, it's just a really good blues song, but... Uh, there's a great anecdote behind this album is that he recorded it and um, the album artwork is just a white it's it's blank white with the words on it and it says this is Howlin' Wolf's new album he doesn't like it he didn't like his electric guitar at first either so, because apparently he recorded this thing and the record label he released it under I think it was like Cadet or something um, he hated the record and they were like fuck it we're gonna put it out because you recorded it <laughs> and um they decided to put that. They decided to put on the album cover that he didn't like the album, and I guess even for you know for Helen Wolf at the time, like it flopped commercially, and like nobody wanted to buy it because like well. I want to ask you a question. You know, if somebody, if an artist releases an album and on the cover it's like, I think this is a shitty album, or you know, this artist doesn't like the doesn't like his own record. Would, would you listen to oh, it? Would you? It yeah. It. Would it would it stop you or what? He was pissed. He was so I, mad. Yeah. That's so funny. He was mad that they released it like entirely. Yes, he he thought it, he thought wow. it was he thought it was garbage. Um, I think at the time he was still kind of um, uh, he was still kind of you know not uh, not into uh, you know the electric blues I guess, and it had like a little bit of like psychedelic stuff going on. Uh, so yeah, it was released in 1969, and yeah, he did uh, he did not enjoy it. Um, and uh, I'd probably want to I'd probably want to listen to it. Yeah. See what, see what, see what he, you know, cause it, just like, you know, artists post stuff that they do like. So if he doesn't like it, I mean, yeah. that's like another side of him that <laughs> so we're getting. So apparently uh, the official, the official quote, uh, when, when Helen Wolf was asked about this album, he described it as quote dog shit <laughs> unquote. <laughs> so yeah, man, Absolute that, uh, that worked. It didn't sell well. And, uh, I guess evidently the, uh, whoever did the packaging and, and, you know, for this record decided that was probably the last one where he was like, this artist does not like this album. But yeah, that's my song of the week. It's called 300 Pounds of Joy uh, from the great <laughs> Howlin' Wolf. Um, so if you, if, you guys, if you guys like music and you haven't gotten in the blues, I will always tell anyone who's a fan of music to uh, give the blues yeah. a chance. So Howlin' Wolf is a great place to start. Awesome. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. I just added it to the list. Yeah, um, I had to had to had to find it. I found had to look up the album yeah. title first. Well, but, evidently the album um, was just called the Howlin' Wolf album. So, yeah, very that's that's fantastic. 
Um, for my song of the week, I w- I'm going to pick something that it's from a band that I've seen live. I've actually seen them and they're really great live. And the band is Mute Math. Have you ever listened to Mute Math, Chris? I have never intentionally listened to them. I'm sure I may have heard something in yeah. passing, but the, I got a clean they slate this, right now. Lay it on me. Nice. Yeah, Mute Math. They have a they have this prog rock, um, very like experimental, like atmospheric sound to them. Mm-hmm. They're very like, and um, you know, just kind of the songs just kind of go, and and they have like kind of jams, like kind of like electronic jams. Oh yeah. But it's not, I mean, it's very, you know, it's obviously based in with the, all the instruments. But um, so when I saw them, they, they do this thing where they like, you know, at the end of their set, they just, it kind of gets into like this haze and then they like, you know, destroy the, destroy the stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like one of the things they destroyed, they destroyed their, and they have those really like, they have like one weird instrument that's like, it's like a guitar, but it's like, a, I don't know, it's like touch screen something. It's like really crazy sounds. Yep. Anyway, so the band is Mute Math and, it's a song off their album Vitals um, in 2015, and the title is Light Up. And it's just, I actually heard it for the first time. So I've heard, I listened to their old stuff. I saw them probably like in around high school, like 2013. So before this album came out, um, and I haven't really listened to this album all that much, but I'm gonna. And I, but I pulled them, put them on the other day because I was doing some work. And yeah, this song is just, it's actually really pretty upbeat and has like just a really great, a great vibe to it and um it made me really happy and nice. it's a great driving song i put it on the car oh, so yeah. um yeah i'm gonna go light up by mute math it's just really good and it's a band that um i forgot it's just forgot about that was so good um yeah they're they're great awesome they're, they're really fun so i will for sure be checking yeah. that out uh another note i really appreciate you're wearing a uh, mount rainier shirt today uh that's pretty yeah, fantastic yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of that yeah. uh <clears throat> I got it when I was uh, I visited this summer. You saw the Rainier to, fog to, in person. Yeah, I did. I, did I, I the only thing I regret about it all is I didn't pick up pick up a six pack Rainier beer before I went to went before I went on the hike for a Rainier yeah. beer. Exactly. Hey, we'll go back yeah. and we'll uh, we'll make that happen. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, <clears throat> absolutely. Thanks everyone for listening. Got some good STP talk. Got some good Imagine Dragons talk, if that's possible. And uh, another week of music fellowship is officially in the books. Ethan, I had a lot of fun, as I said, uh, recording this podcast with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, doing it again for next week's episode, uh, whatever topic that may be. But um, once again, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, Ethan, it was great. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Happy 29th birthday. To the core on September 29, 29 on 29. The golden that's birthday. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, yep, great episode. Thanks, Chris. And we'll, we'll see everybody on the page and we'll talk to you guys later. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Rock and roll. This is, I was, dude, I was just, I was thinking, uh, this is along the same lines of, of something that, well, not, the, not, not really, but I was thinking about the ultimate way to get back at somebody mm-hmm. and to really hit them where it hurts. Yeah. And, um, this would be a good story, Drew. I don't know what you want to do with this, but, uh, not really, <laughs> but, um, I, I was just thinking like what, like if you take some, like, obviously like if you steal something from them or take, yeah you know, a car or whatever, it's like replaceable. But I was thinking like, cause I was like, we're on our property and like, we're having a kind of, there's like some, the neighbor wants to put up a fence and then like, you know, to like right down our Creek line and it like cutting oh. off some of the area that my dad like has used for, you know, 50 years and stuff. But like, it's yeah. technically their property. So now they're gonna have to take care of it all. Right. And I was thinking like how, like, so when trees fall down, like it's their, like their prerogative, but if you wanted to, I feel like this could be really diabolical if somebody really cares about their land and stuff. If you go and just cut down all of their trees, like <laughs> you can't, you can't, you just, can't, you can't, you just can't get plant. that back. You can't, you can't just <laughs> you go can't, to the store just, and buy a, a yeah, 90 cannot. foot oak tree.
<laughs> yeah, you cannot get a 90 foot tree and replant that bitch. Like w- when when a tree comes down, dude, I mean, that's it. <laughs> it's it's going to be 30 years till you have a tree anywhere close to that. Yeah. And like cuz I was saying like you can get more cows if you if you like if oh, all yeah. your, you know, cattle gets killed or yeah. all that. But if you cut down your trees, dude, dude, and they really like them, oh man, you're done. Like if my dad, <laughs> if I really got mad at my dad and I cut down all of our trees. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine he comes home and all the trees are gone? Dude, yeah, exactly. Dude, you cut you down, you so cut down some of the trees. That's all it would take. I mean, that's that I is, think that's like the that's like dude, one of the worst di- things. Yeah, because like you you have to get get them in the situations. Like where, you could um, build a house in less than a year. You can't build a tree, dude. Oh no, you can't. You can't build a tree in you a lifetime. Some of those suckers. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You know the old pro the old proverb like you don't plant a tree. Uh, you plant a tree so other people can enjoy the shade or something like that. Yeah, you know yeah, mean? something that. Like, uh, well, that's like the same thing. You ever hear the joke? It's like, oh, like I decided to like, like some someone I hate. Like I'm gonna butcher this, but basically, like there was somebody that they hated, and to get back at them, like <laughs> they they taught their child how to ride a bike because it's like once the kid knows how to ride a bike, like you can't teach them again. So you just take you take that moment away from the parents. <laughs> Yeah, they can never do it again. The kid already knows. That's amazing. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's another good one. That's perfect. So what? I'd what rather talk. Worst? I'd rather talk about this than Scott. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Like, those are two good ones. Yeah, those moments and like, yeah, obviously you can't uh, put those roots back in. It's it's funny. Oh my god. Mm-hmm.